Um, and, and can you my, um, and can you see my cursor when it's on the slides? This is a question. Yeah. Okay. So this is the fix to getting. There's a incidentally, if you have to give one of these talks in the future, you have to change keynotes and defaults to get it to show your cursor when you're in uh, presentation mode. So, um, okay. So, so uh, well, I don't know if I will succeed in conveying and addressing all of the interesting points that Steve brought up in his very kind introduction, but uh, I do want to talk a little bit about uh, some interesting structures and aspects of Higgs effective field theories today. And this is mostly going to be based on work uh, done with uh, some collaborators that came out in January, but also primarily work that's still to appear uh, with Tim Cohen, Xiao Chuang Lu, and Dave Sutherland. And I'd just like to highlight Xiao Chuang is a postdoc at uh, University of Oregon. Dave was a postdoc at Santa Barbara. He's now a Fellini Fellow in Trieste. And this last year has kind of been a, a rough year for me health-wise, even apart from coronavirus. So Xiao Chuang and Dave have been doing a lot of uh, really great heavy lifting uh, in this, this work that I'll describe. Um, so, you know, the question of why, why we should care about Higgs EFTs right now is, is really because they are what imparts meaning to the host of measurements that are being made at the LHC. So, um, you know, we, this is just a summary plot, for example, of Atlas measurements in various production and decay modes for the Higgs as of the end of run two. But um, this program, which is currently a large fraction of what's going on in the LHC, uh, measuring Higgs properties to greater and greater precision, this is only going to grow, uh, in part because Higgs measurements are one of the few sets of interesting measurements where our current precision uh, is statistics limited. And even during the, the sort of more complicated run conditions of a high luminosity LHC, uh, the precision will increase substantially because the final states are relatively clean. Um, and so at the end of the day, we expect to be able to get 5 to 10 percent precision in most channels for Higgs couplings, which is, I think, something, considering when the LHC was constructed, we didn't think we could discover the standard model Higgs. Uh, this is quite uh, an amazing development. But um, at the end of the day, right, whatever these measurements tell us, interpreting them, whether they're in agreement with the standard model or disagree with the standard model, requires an EFT framework, right? If they disagree, then obviously you need to know, you need to have a framework in which you can understand what, they, what they're telling you. But even if they agree with the standard model, you'd like to know, this 5% level agreement with the standard model tell you about the scale of new physics or bounding the scale of new physics. Uh, and so that's strong motivation to develop and understand EFT is appropriate for describing the Higgs. Um, and you also might have thought, given that we've had the Higgs for many decades, we would have had uh, equivalent progress in developing EFTs for the Higgs. But you know, surprisingly, we've only had a complete basis uh, in, in one particular EFT at one particular uh, order in power counting, we've only had a complete basis for 10 years. So there's a lot about the structure of Higgs EFTs that we also uh, had yet to develop. And so this talk, I want to touch on two aspects. Um, the first I'll, I'll roughly categorize is which EFT, which is to say uh, which EFT framework is appropriate for describing the Higgs and, and how to understand the differences between them. Uh, and then I want to pivot to a specific EFT framework, the standard model EFT framework, and talk a little bit at the end about surprising structures. So not only are these EFTs useful for interpreting data, but they also just turn out to be fascinating, effective field theories on their own. And to the extent that you know, I and we are field theorists who like to study motivated field theories, uh, this is a great opportunity to discover, discover new things. Okay, uh, so part one, uh, which is which EFT, so I should say the title of this section comes from a paper by uh, Ricardo Ritazzi and Adam Falkowski from early in 2019, uh, but uh, and I'll review what they, how, how they attempt to answer this question, uh, but also attempt to give you a broader, broader answer. Um, so there is a question, you know, if you want to come up with an EFT extension of the standard model appropriate for describing modifications of the Higgs sector, uh, you have a choice, which is how you actually uh, choose to package together the Higgs degrees of freedom. So I think the thing that you might think of first when you think about an EFT appropriate for uh, discussing the Higgs is to just take the gauge invariant degrees of freedom in the standard model high energies, including a scalar doublet for the Higgs, uh, and to construct an EFT out of all possible relevant operators. Um, so this EFT is what we know as, as the standard model EFT or SMEF, and the idea is just to put these four degrees of freedom into an SU2 doublet, or equivalently uh, into an, an O4 fundamental. And so here, you know, this is just packing them in the O4 fundamental, which transforms linearly under the O4 global symmetry transformations. And of course, at the end of the day, for the standard model, you know, we break this symmetry by gauging the SC2 cross E1, but it's really the O4 structure that's the interesting part. And I should say, you know, for almost the entirety of this talk, I'm going to ignore the gauging uh, and just work in the global symmetry limit because that's sufficient to, uh, I think, understand the most interesting features of the EFT. So of course, you construct an EFT this way uh, out of degrees of freedom that the O4 symmetry acts on linearly. We say electric symmetry is linearly realized. 
And then, for example, the standard model uh, just consists of the, the two marginal and relevant terms you can construct uh, out, of, out of this field phi. Um, but you can also imagine them constructing an EFT, uh, which includes irrelevant operators. And if you just focus on the bosonic sector, again, ignoring the, the gauging of the symmetry, uh, that also just has a few possible terms. So it's possible, of course, to dress up the kinetic term uh, with an arbitrary function uh, of the length, uh, phi dot phi. And then you can also, of course, do a different O4 contraction uh, between phi and its derivative. You can square that to make a global symmetry invariant, and you can dress that up with an arbitrary function again, uh, the length of phi. Uh, so those are the two possible classes of two derivative terms that you can consider writing down. And then, of course, you can write down an arbitrary uh, potential that's also a function of the mod squared of phi. Of course, you know, in a full EFT, you also have higher derivative terms. You also have couplings to fermions. Uh, these are sort of, from the perspective of studying the structure of the EFT, these are really uh, ancillary questions. And so for most of, of the what follows, I'm just going to focus on the scalar sector of the EFT and think about the theory of the two derivatives. So that's a choice. What's the other choice? The other obvious choice uh, is to not assume anything about how the scalar that we've discovered at the LHC relates to the goldstones uh, of, of spontaneously broken O4 symmetry. And so the other option is to construct what we call the Higgs EFT or heft, uh, which just you know, uh, involves saying that the Higgs that we've discovered is a real scalar degree of freedom, little h, and then packaging the goldstone separately as the goldstones of O4 broken to O3. Uh, and so you know, a convenient parameterization of that is just to have the field h, and then to arrange the three goldstones into a constrained multiplet, uh, which I'll call this little vector n. And that's a nice multiplet because, of course, the O4 transformations act li linearly on it. Uh, but if you just think about how the O4 transformations act on the goldstones, one, two, and three, uh, then of course the symmetry is nonlinearly realized. And so we're free, of course, to construct an EFT out of these degrees of freedom as well. Uh, so we can write down the standard model. So there's the standard model in, in this parameterization. Uh, but we could also write down a more general EFT. And in that general EFT, again, up to two derivatives, uh, of course, you have the two derivative term for this real scalar H. That can have some arbitrary function of H addressing it. Uh, there's also the two derivative term for the goldstones, which can have some arbitrary function of H dressing it. And then we can construct a, uh, a potential for H and then higher derivative terms. Um, of course, it's, it's very conventional. And in some points, I will redefine H itself to absorb this cofactor of K, this function of H, uh, and to give it canonical kinetic terms. But on the other hand, if you're actually doing a matching calculation to figure out how these EFTs arise, then keeping track of this factor is, is appropriate. You can also ask, uh, so in the standard model EFT, uh, you can ask what the power counting is. There, the factors of scale can be made up with some independent scale uh, that determines the breakdown of perturbative unitarity of the EFT. In the Higgs EFT, the scale you have available to you is, is just the scale V. Uh, and so anytime you see irrelevant operators, the scale is made up by power. So, okay, so these are our two choices. And um, hopefully it's clear that uh, in terms of the sizes of these different theories, which theories can contain each other, uh, that SMEFT is in some sense a subset of excuse me, this, the standard model is a subset of SMEFT, which itself is a subset of HEFT. Um, the, that direction that SMEFT can be written as HEFT should, should be somewhat obvious. Uh, I can always take my linear, ter linear parameterization in terms of the field phi and rewrite it in terms of the HEFT degrees of freedom. Uh, and so I can, of course, always put a SMEFT into the form of HEFT. And so, for example, if I take my SMEFT Lagrangian in terms of the linearly realized uh, field phi, I can rewrite it in terms of HEFT. And what I find is that these coefficients, these functions k and f and heft, now they just become particular functions uh, of the Higgs, the real scalar h and the Higgs of v that are always correlated in some interesting way. Okay. So SMEFT is a subset of heft in which there are always correlations between the appearance of v and the Higgs fluctuation at every order. All right. But clearly heft itself is a larger theory, uh, which also can contain terms of just correlations absent. So the more interesting question is, you know, when are you in a situation, when are we in a universe, uh, when does data tell us, for example, that uh, the theory is heft, but it cannot be written in any way as smart? So maybe the first thing you say is, well, you know, it's sort of obvious when you have a linear parameterization or nonlinear one, how the terms are organized. So maybe we can just tell by eye. Maybe we fit the data with some Lagrangian and we can tell by eye whether it's heft or snuff. Uh, so here's, here's an example, here's a Lagrangian, and to encourage audience participation, we can do a little vote using the show of hands function on Zoom. Um, so you can vote on whether you think this is a SMEFT or, or HEFT. So how many people think this is describable as SMEFT? Show of hands, people think it's SMEFT, SMEFT votes? Okay. How many people think that it is describable only as HEFT and not as SMEFT? 
Okay, so I'm, so I'm sure I, I can't see all the hands, but I'm, all right. So, so there's some votes. Um, okay, so, so we've made our votes, uh, so let's go. And so you look at it, and it looks like, well, there's terms between H and V that have some relative factors of three-fourth, so maybe it has to be half. Uh, but of course, we're free to do a, a field redefinition. Uh, so let's do a field redefinition on what we call the H degree of freedom. And uh, in terms of that redefined variable, this is actually the standard model. Okay. So, so it's, uh, it's not even SMAFT, right? It is a, it is a, although it looked like I gave you a theory with some irrelevant operators, uh, it is a purely renormalizable theory that we know and love. And so this, you know, this tells you that you can't just obviously look at, at a parameterization of the theory and decide whether it can be written as heft or SMAFT. Um, so there was an interesting paper that came out last year by Ricardo Rotazzi and Adam Polkowski trying to answer in some sort of robust way when you had a theory that must be written as heft and could not be written as SMEFT. Um, and the claim that they made was that uh, a theory can only be written as SMEFT, uh, an EFT can only be written as SMEFT, when if you take the theory and you parameterize it in terms of the doublet, capital H, the SU2 doublet, uh, then if the potential in the terms of those variables is analytic uh, at the origin uh, of that, that doublet field. So that in terms of the physical fluctuation of little h, that would be at the point little h is equal to minus v. So very far away from where we live. Uh, but if, if the Lagrangian written in those terms is analytic at the origin, uh, yeah, if you've got a question, go for it. You're, you're, unfortunately, you're muted, Julio, you're, you're muted. Sorry, yeah. Is it because if it was not just the same LEFT, we might expect something else to become light? somewhere else out there in the modeling space or? Yeah, so certainly there's a question of, of absolutely. So, so and that, that ultimately, yeah, the, the source of the non-analyticity is an interesting question. And so that will become a more interesting part of the talk in a bit, but absolutely. But even without speculating as to the origin of the analyticity, the claim is simply that if you have an EFT uh, and you try to write it in terms of the double, you're always free to do that uh, because you can do a change of variables. Uh, that if the potential uh, for that double is non-analytic at the origin, then it cannot be written as now. And so, you know, their observation is just, so if you, if you, you can always take your uh, unitary gauge, for example, take little h, the real scalar we've seen, package it in terms of a doublet, uh, as the square root of the, you know, the magnitude squared of that doublet. Uh, and then if you have SMEF, then your potential is some polynomial uh, in the doublet itself. And in half, of course, you have a general polynomial in little h. And so the example that they, they probed in more detail, you know, was, was really um, motivated by measurements that are going to be happening at the LHC over the next, dec next decade to measure the Higgs self-coupling. So there's a huge research program at the LHC. In fact, it's, I would say, the largest, the most active set uh, of LHC measurements regarding the Higgs are the attempt to pin down uh, the Higgs self-coupling. And we should be able to get about a 50% measurement of the Higgs qubit coupling by the end of the HLHC. Uh, and so you could simply ask, um, imagine you had a theory to, imagine you saw a deviation from the standard model prediction, the Higgs self-coupling. And so they said, well, consider a scenario where uh, you, you ended up measuring something that you could interpret as uh, the cubic coupling of the Higgs being equal to the standard model value plus a little bit, delta three, and the quartic, for example, just for simplicity, let's say was pinned at the standard model value. Of course, rewriting that in terms of the doublet, then you get a piece that is exactly standard model-like plus a piece that's proportional to the extra bit of the cubic. And that extra bit of the cubic is precisely what's uh, the piece that is non-analytic in the doublet at the origin. Okay. Um, so the, there's an interesting physical consequence of this if you have such a deviation, which is that the non-analyticity at the origin, in terms of observables, things you actually measure, uh, translates into perturbative unitarity violation in the scattering of goldstones or equivalently longitudinal vectors into multiple Higgses. And that uh, scale of unitarity violation happens right at four pi feet. Now that's something you know you would have already said if from the beginning I told you, well, look, you construct an EFT, the scale in the EFT is V, you would say, sure, perturbative unitarity violation should happen at four pi V. But it's actually not obvious that that's exactly at four pi V where the unitarity breakdown happens. Because of course I could have the dimensionless coefficients in the EFT could all be small. And then you would expect perturbative unitarity violation could happen at 4 pi v leveraged up by these small coefficients. Um, but the argument that they make to really point out that non-analyticity tells you you have to be in heft corresponding to unitarity breakdown at 4 pi v um, is that really this, this sum over uh, this inelastic processes of Goldstone's going to any number of Higgses um, blows up exponentially in Mandelstam s over 4 pi v squared. And so that tells you you're actually only logarithmically sensitive uh, to the coefficients, dimensionless coefficients in the EFT uh, in terms of the scale of unitarity violation. So that really tells you unitarity is violated at 4 pi v, and that is a half-like theory as opposed to SMAP. 
Um, I just want to talk briefly about where the bound comes from because it's if you normally talk about perturbative unitarity violation, we're very much accustomed to doing that uh, in terms of thinking about processes with elastic two to two scattering. And so the argument, while it's been around for a while, uh, for placing unitarity violation bounds on inelastic processes uh, is, is fun to point out. So the basic idea, right, anytime we're talking about perturbative unitarity, uh, we're writing down the S matrix. Uh, you can think of it, you know, again, as the exponential of some Hermitian operator. And because the maximal phase shift is pi, the eigenvalues of that operator are, are at most pi uh, in a theory with perturbative unitarity. And so in the Born approximation, right, we know that, that uh, that uh, this, this Hermitian operator delta is, is uh, actually the T matrix. Uh, and so we can translate this bound uh, on the eigenvalues of delta into a bound uh, on the matrix element of, of mod T squared. Uh, and the, the, so in this case, that's bounded for normalized states by pi squared. And normally you think also this bound, this bound is usually phrased in terms of a bound uh, of some matrix elements being less than uh, one. Uh, but the factor of pi is somewhat important uh, if you're, well, one, because you're thinking about these things as being phases with maximum value pi, but also that gives you the appearance of pi squared uh, in, in the unitary bound that will become important in a bit. So uh, you can use this bound in general as long as you can construct some normalized states. And so the key is if you want to set a unitary bound on some inelastic processes, uh, then you, you, of course, plane waves are not normalizable, uh, and generally plane wave states are not normalized. But uh, if you do a partial wave expansion, then of course, in any particular channel, you can construct normalized states and you can apply these uh, perturbative unitary bounds. So what Falkowski and Rotazzi considered was uh, just to consider two Goldstone scattering uh, into any number of Higgses and just to consider the, the zero angular momentum sector in a partial wave expansion uh, and then applying the partial wave expansion to the perturbative unitarity argument tells you that if you sum over all of these uh, channels with any number of Higgses, then uh, there will be perturbative uh, breakdown of perturbative unitarity at some scale uh, lambda star. And uh, so then they go ahead and they compute in this simple example where they imagine you've changed the Higgs cubic by some small amount relative to the standard model uh, corresponding to a non elasticity And sure enough, you find out uh, that the, the scale of breakdown uh, goes exponentially in this scale. So un perturbative unitarity is broken down at a scale that is pinned exponentially to be 4 pi v. Uh, and, and getting the factors of 4 pi right, uh, that, that's why we bothered in the perturbative unitary definition to include the phase pi. Okay, so that's what really tells you that uh, if there's non-analyticity, unitarity breaks down at 4 pi v, uh, and you're only logarithmically sensitive to any dimensionless coefficients in your EFT. All right, so that's one way, that's, that's an attempt to define what we mean by a uh, theory that cannot be described as the standard model EFT that has to be described as heft. Um, there was another approach to this, which is probably more familiar, I guess, to most of you uh, coming from a more formal community. I apologize for being a phenomenologist. Uh, this is somewhat newer to phenomenologists. Um, there was another useful attempt at trying to distinguish heft and SMEF uh, that was made by uh, Manohar Jenkins and Rodrigo Alonso. Uh, in 2015 and 2016, which was just to think about the EFTs in terms of their geometry. So of course, uh, thinking about EFTs geometrically is very familiar uh, for those of you who study nonlinear sigma models. Um, the basic idea is just instead of thinking about the properties of the potential, think about the two derivative terms as defining a metric on the scalar field manifold, uh, and then the potential is just some function defined on it. And of course, uh, we want this you know, Lagrangian to be analytic in order to do perturbation theory. So this application, uh, the geometric application to thinking about heft uh, was, was first made by, by Manohar and collaborators in 2015 and 2016. Um, and uh, well, here's a picture uh, to sort of sketch the, the argument for how the geometric way of thinking about these EFTs should work. So um, of course, the symmetry for these Higgs EFTs that we're interested in is, is 04, but uh, I can't draw uh, you know, three spheres, five herd on H, and so I'm, I'm just going to give you the O2 example. Uh, so the, the picture you should have in mind, right, is that uh, there's some scalar field manifold for this DFT. Um, in the O2 example, there's an H direction, and at every point in H, the circle, in this case for O2, of the Goldstones has some radius to it uh, that is given by whatever the value of V times this function F is in the Heft Lagrangian. Um, and uh, of course, we live here at this uh, green point uh, where the Higgs fluctuation is uh, up along the parabola and uh, the, the Goldstone uh, direction is along these circles. Uh, 
Uh, and the fixed point where the electric symmetry is restored, uh, where we expand our linear, our linear parameterization of the theory, is down at the bottom of, of this parabola. And that's a fixed point, because of course, if you're down there, then uh, translations in the Goldstone direction don't change the theory at all. So the criteria, you know, it's, it's fairly clear. Um, if you want to have an EFT and you want to write it as SMEFT, then the, your scalar field manifold should contain the O4 fixed point. Okay, and, and to containing the old four fixed point means that somewhere in your field space, this function f in your heft parameterization should be equal to zero. Right? If if there is a point where that is the case, then uh, the psi, the the s three in the case of the the true electric symmetry, the s three radius uh, goes to zero, and, and you're actually at a fixed point. Okay. Um, so. Uh, Alonso Jenkins and Manikar came up then with a, a simple criteria for deciding whether a theory could be written as SMEFT or had to be written as HEFT, which was that you know, it was HEFT that could not be written as SMEFT if in some sense there was a hole in the scalar field manifold, so that the symmetric point, the O4 fixed point, just isn't on the manifold. Okay, so, so my heuristic cartoon here is this sort of funnel where the nominal O4 fixed point just doesn't exist. Uh, and that corresponds, of course, to there never being a point where this function F uh, vanishes. Okay, so then, then there's always a finite radius of the Goldstone sphere, um, and uh, that theory, such a theory, simply doesn't have a well-defined expansion in terms of uh, these linear coordinates of SMEF. Uh, but if you, so that, that was their criteria for theories of half the cannot be the SMEF, but of course there are lots of things that should bother you about that. Um, one of them is that you already know if you took a theory that is a SMEF theory, right, uh, and you write it as a half theory, that yes, it has these functions k and f, but these functions are not arbitrary functions in h. They have uh, an infinite number of conditions on the different powers of v and h that tell you that v and h are correlated. And the existence of that infinite number of conditions is not somehow captured uh, by whether or not this function f vanishes somewhere. Okay. So there's somewhere, if, if you truly want to come up with a universal criteria for understanding whether your theory ha can be heft or can be smeft, it has to be more than just a simple criteria uh, whether or not there's a point on the manifold where this function f vanishes. Um, so, so something is missing, but before we understand what's missing, it's also just worth thinking about. Maybe you can just explain again about the whole, what exactly the physical meaning of this is. Good. So let me give you an example. Thank that. That's sort of a wonderful lead in. So what would it mean to have a hole uh, in your scalar manifold? So let me give you an example. So as far as I know, uh, the, the easiest way to get a hole um, in this case is to have some other degree of freedom that you integrated out of your EFT that also broke the symmetry. Okay, so the, the simplest way to see that is actually just to think about the O2 example. Uh, so think about um, a two abelian Higgs model, where so your symmetry, your gauge symmetry would be U1, your global symmetry is O2. Uh, so now you have two Higgses and they have incommensurate charges. So, so maybe they, or they have, different, sorry, not incommensurate, they have different charges. One Higgs with charge plus two, one Higgs with charge plus one. They're different representations of, of the symmetry. Uh, and they both acquire events. Okay. So in that theory, uh, generically as a function of the parameters, there's some light real scalar Higgs uh, and some uh, heavy real scalar Higgs. There's uh, a light goldstone in some of There are two. There's uh, a light goldstone, and then there's this other uh, heavy goldstone degree of freedom that we've eaten. And so you can, at the end of the day, integrate out the heavy degrees of freedom to obtain the EFT of light degrees of freedom. And what you find is in the EFT parameterization, uh, of light degrees of freedom, having integrated out the heavy ones, uh, in uh, conventions where the function k, so the, the light scalar, real scalar, is canonically normalized, this function f has the form of the sum of two squares. And so there is no point, right, as you move across the, around the moduli space of h, there is no point where that function vanishes uh, for generic values of these constants, which are just mixed angles. Okay, so that's a straightforward example of a scalar manifold where you have a hole. Uh, there is no fixed point on the manifold because something heavy that you integrated out broke the symmetry. Um, the analogy that's appropriate for the standard model, um, for the O4 symmetry, you know, the idea is you need another scalar that was in a different representation. And so, of course, uh, any number of Higgs doublets uh, would not give this to you because you can always go, you can always do a field redefinition so that all of the VEVs are in one doublet. Uh, but if you had another electric representation, so like you had a Higgs triplet, for example, then, uh, and the Higgs triplet also acquired a VEV, then the, the VEV of the Higgs triplet would precisely make a hole in, uh, in the EFT manifold of the light scalar. Okay. So that's, that's uh, I haven't seen this observation made anywhere else. And in fact, I have a, 
general question for those of you with more formal backgrounds. Uh, if anywhere there is a systematic classification of holes and singularities in effective actions, uh, the result from integrating things out. But uh, this was the simplest example I could think of in which you, you get a hole in your scalar field manifold. If something else got a dev and you integrate it out. Does that, see, does that answer your question or at least satisfy you? Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Okay. So that's, in some sense, this is the case that I think Manahar and company picked out. But, um, you know, especially for, for those of you who think about uh, EFTs from a geometric perspective or uh, nonlinear sigma models from a geometric perspective, there's a more obvious case that's missing from that classification, which is that it's also possible just to have a cone or a cusp uh, at what you thought would have been your invariant point. So, again, I apologize as a phenomenologist. This is somewhat novel. I appreciate for more formal theorists, this is sort of run of the mill. Um, so it's, it's also possible that, that uh, where you wanted your invariant fixed point to be on the manifold, that instead there's a cone or a cusp. And you have to be a little, of course, careful identifying the existence of a cone or a cusp, because if you just use the heft coordinates, uh, that's some chart uh, on your manifold, and that chart degenerates at the symmetric point. And so if you just look at, at the heft Lagrangian and ask, for example, for the functions of the Higgs and the heft Lagrangian to be analytic, uh, to diagnose whether there's a, some sort of cusp or cone, that generally isn't a good guide because the chart itself degenerates there. So you have to do what you do in GR, which is uh, try to look for real singularities on the manifold uh, by looking at uh, curvature invariants uh, and you know, covariant derivatives of those objects, so general, sort of generalized curvatures. And so in particular, uh, you can identify the existence of a cone or a cusp to some degree um, if either, say, the, uh, the Ricci scalar uh, or the uh, scalar potential or covariant derivatives of those diverge at what would have been your, your fixed point. So um, in order to be sure that there's no singularity at your 04 fixed point, then you really you actually have an infinite set of conditions, which is that all of the appropriately constructed covariant derivatives uh, of the Ricci scalar and all of the appropriately constructed covariant derivatives of the scalar potential all have to be finite at what you think your O4 invariant fixed point can be. And so if those are all finite, then sure enough, you know, that's a well-behaved point, uh, smooth point on your manifold. Um, and then again, you are able to write half the SMEFT. And what's nice about thinking about it this way is this is where you can see, you know, again, if you wrote SMEFT as heft, you would get these functions K and F, but they would have um, an infinite number of uh, conditions on terms at various powers in H, reflecting the fact that they could only have come from the mod squared of a doublet. That infinite set of conditions precisely comes from requiring that these infinite sets of derivatives of the Ricci scalar and the scalar potential be finite at the invariant fixed point. Okay. So this, that's a new extra criteria on top of what, uh, what was imposed before. Uh, the intuition for this, of course, again, for those of you who think about nonlinear sigma models, is this is sort of the most straightforward case. You get a cone or a cusp when you integrate it out, something that was massless. And this comes back to Julio's question, you know, a source of non-analyticity, maybe the one you were expecting was you integrate something out. And uh, so a nice example is just think about integrating out chiral fermions. Uh, let me construct a vector-like set of fermions that get some mass from the Higgs and some mass from, from vector-like masses of their own. Um, and so of course, this case is missed by the Manahar criteria because uh, this function f in the heft parameterization vanishes at the O4 invariant fixed point. So by their criteria, this is a perfectly acceptable example. Uh, but then you can, for example, compute the Ricci scalar. And so the Ricci scalar at the, you integrate out these fermions, the Ricci scalar at the O4 invariant fixed point, uh, of course, it has a loop factor, and then it goes like one over the square of the vector-like masses. So of course, for finite mass, any finite value of the mass, the curvature is finite. And SMEFT is consistent, but if you take m to zero, uh, and so a particle becomes massless at the O4 invariant fixed point, then the curvature blows up. Okay, um, and uh, so this is a, a simple geometric way of, of seeing another way that you get. Yeah. So this this leads, I think, to what is the correct universal distinction between uh, when you have uh, an effective theory of the Higgs that can be written as SMEFT versus heft, which is to say, you know, in the heft parameterization, uh, here again, I'm canonically normalizing the Higgs degree of freedom you have to meet three criteria, right? So you have to have some O4 invariant fixed point, which is characterized by there being some point on the Higgs manifold where this function F vanishes. And then the metric has to be analytic at that point in the sense that you know, F and K admit convergent Taylor expansions in some sort of good chart. Uh, and that can be diagnosed by all of the curvature invariants and the covariant derivatives being finite. Uh, and then also you have to insist that 
any functions defined on this manifold are also well behaved at this point. So the potential has to be analytic and that can be diagnosed independent of your parameterization by insisting that arbitrary covariant derivatives of the potential are also finite. Um, so I think this is, this is the, from, a, from a particle theorist's perspective, this is useful because despite the fact that there are these two obvious EFTs for describing uh, extensions of the Higgs beyond the standard model, nobody up until this point has come up with some sort of completely valid universal criteria for understanding when you're in which situation. And as far as I know, this is, this is a completely uniform criteria. Okay. Yeah. So, can you, so traditionally, I would try to think about this in terms of symmetry, because one of them has certain symmetry, which is restored at a certain scale, and it, it is normally realized at low energies, where, whereas the other one doesn't. So, uh, well, is that is that intuition just wrong? Yeah. Or? So, so here, here's another reason why I think this is useful. Is that that I'm not sure if it's a violation of intuition or not, but let me give you an example. So yeah, I, I would say normally if you told someone, oh, is it, is it a half DFT or a snap DFT, they would say, well, something else is messing up the electric symmetry, right? So either something got a VEV in addition to the Higgs and broke the electric symmetry, and so that moves the symmetry restoration point, or uh, there were some electric degrees of freedom, right, that, that somehow got integrated out. But um, you could just have a, a real scalar singlet, right, that couples to H through H squared phi squared, so that has no electric charges, right, nothing. Nonetheless, Right, if that gets all of its mass from the Higgs, then that effective field theory is heft. Okay, so nothing, nothing violent has happened to electric symmetry. It's just the Higgs portal. It's totally standard model singular degrees of freedom. But the EFT of, of that theory, that is heft. And so I think that to me is the, you know, the sort of what you get on top of your intuition by taking this geometric perspective is to understand those interesting cases where that also, incidentally, that's a case where you know, you, you might also, I think something that's, that's common for people to think of is, well, if it had to be half, to no, electric symmetry is nonlinearly realized, your know, precision electric weak should go crazy, right? Like the S and T parameters should be badly deviating from the standard model, that kind of thing. But this singlet example, this is the case, that's a custodially symmetric deformation. S is zero, right? So precision electric weak is perfectly well behaved, but the theory has to be half. So that's, that's somewhat interesting. That's, that's surprising. Um, Can I ask one more question about this? Yeah. Um, it, it, there's, it, there's a case which, which I was thinking of, which I wasn't sure whether it's covered by your list. Um, so roughly speaking, if you go back to the previous slide, yeah. the, uh, you know, you, 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 you want, you're thinking of this point H star where the, where the F function vanishes as being roughly speaking some finite distance away in field space. From um, but you might, and, and you're putting conditions on what happens there, but you might, Imagine, and I think there are examples of this in sufficiently controlled situations, that, that this point is in an infinite distance in, in field space away right, so in the, in the I, metric I, that you're using. Right, so that, that generically is a property of these, these the, the sort of holes, right? So, so certainly if I have a- But it might not be a hole, it might not be a hole in, in the, in the sense, okay. it's, it's, it's not topologically a hole. Okay, okay. so you, you would say there would be points, singular points that could be infinite distance away. Right, but this is a metric property of the space. You only see it by because the, the kinetic terms blow up in a certain way. It's not because, in, in your whole examples, the scalar manifold really ended because at some finite distance, some other degrees of freedom became less. But that might happen, that might also happen at, at an infinite distance point. Good, okay, no, th this is great. So, so something I am interested in understanding now is, is a systematic classification of the singularities and the effective action and where they come from. So what, uh, in these cases where you just have a singular point that's an infinite distance, what is the what is the UV physics? Well, for example, in, in, in supersymmetric examples, this typically happens at infinity in the modular space. And it's in it and it is attributable to what? I mean, what what is the microscope? So it happens at infinity. So, there's, so typically, there is still new light degrees of freedom, yeah. but they only appear at a point, roughly speaking, at a point of infinity, and the metric is perfectly finite everywhere. At a finite distance from, from uh, but but it just you know the, the metric blows up or, or doesn't decay yeah. fast yeah. enough yeah. You, you, at infinity yeah. in to my, push it there. In my in my past life, I, I did study. So which way, can you give me the specific example just for my well, almost uh, almost any asymptotically free theory would would have this property. Take cyber take cyber theory for degrees of theory. Okay, good. Right. Yeah. Um, of course, they they also have often interesting points 
in, in the set at finite distance on, on moduli space, but those are more like the those are more like the second set of examples. Right, right. The, the cones are cusps, uh, cusps in the quantum modified moduli yeah. space. Yeah, no, this is good because I, I mean, I really it would be useful to have a sort of completely universal classification of the you know, singularities in the Higgs EFT. Um, Great. Isn't there a simpler example? So if you just put a theory on a circle that you can stabilize the circle, then if that circle, like typically you're going to have points in moduli space where some KK mode becomes light. And if you take a lit, like the small radius limit, those points are going to go off to infinity. To infinity. They're going to yeah. always be there, right? Okay. You mean if the circle is dynamic? Or? Yeah. Yeah. Like a radio. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's another example where, so I think this is not exotic at all, right? No, no, no. Yeah. That's what I mean. Only, it, it happens all the time at weak coupling. Only, only to, uh, only to a mundane, uh, you know, particle phenomenologist. And then, uh, thank you. Um, all right, good. Um, so, so modulo that extra example, which I think can can be fit in this classification. You know, it, it's sort of clear that the geometric thinking of the EFTs, I think, gives us a, a full handle on when F uh, can or cannot be written as math. And so, um, there's though there's also a practical question, which is, you know, this is all sort of in principle. Um, but you could also just ask if you know you're making measurements under what circumstances uh, it is just better to use heft rather than SMEF. You might think SMEF is somehow a more compact EFT. Whenever you can use it, you should use it. Um, but it's clear that even within in situations where the SMEF uh, converges, the SMEF expansion converges, that heft can be a better parameterization of the data. So a simple example is you know just consider a theory where you have two Higgs doublets. Uh, and you just have one sort of light doublet and a second doublet that you couple to the light doublet through a, um, a quartic interaction. And so if you just integrate out that heavy doublet, then you get some, I mean, you can compute exactly uh, the effective theory of the light degree of freedom. So there's some unenlightening Lagrangian for the light degree of freedom. Um, and it's clear if you look at this, that obviously if the mass of the heavy degree of freedom, the bare mass you sent to zero, uh, then you obviously have to be heft because you would no longer be analytic uh, at the invariant fixed point, uh, because you have these, you know, interesting logarithms and, and uh, other, other features in the EFT. But even if the mass parameter of the heavy degree of freedom is finite, so that's a situation in which uh, you're perfectly entitled to use SMEF, you can just ask, you know, if you actually have data and you want to interpret the data, um, it, or what are the circumstances under which SMEF or HEFT uh, turns out to be the better description? And the answer is, you know, HEFT, because HEFT is uh, repackaging the information at different uh, contained in different powers of the real scalar H, it is in some sense summing over infinitely many terms from SMEFT. And so in many situations, even when SMEFT as an EFT uh, you know, is perfectly convergent, uh, it nonetheless provides a much poorer fit to the data than, uh, than fitting to half. So this is a simple example where if you integrated out this heavy doublet, you can think of the parameter, which is just how much mass the heavy doublet gets uh, from the light Higgs degree of freedom versus how much it gets from, uh, from its bare mass. And uh, obviously, if you take this parameter to infinity, then the theory is well described uh, by the standard model. Uh, if you pay, take it, uh, excuse me, if you take it to zero, it's well defined by the, described by the standard model. If you take it above one, then SMEF no longer converges because SMEF is an expansion in this bare parameter M2. Uh, and if it's starting to get more of its mass from the Higgs than from M2, then, then of course the, uh, uh, the SMEFT expansion doesn't, doesn't converge. But even in the intermediate regime, where it's getting more of its mass from its bare term than from the light Higgs degree of freedom, if you just try uh, to understand how this would be fit, uh, so deviations in, say, the Higgs cubic and quartic coupling would be fit by a SMEFT parameterization to this underlying model versus a half parameterization to the underlying model, uh, even for a majority of the mass coming from the bare parameter as opposed to electric symmetry breaking, uh, the heft EFT converges much faster as a description of the data than, uh, than the SMEF parameterization. So this is just a, a reminder that you know, there's the in principle difference between these EFTs, but as far as the data is concerned, there's also an, an in practice difference. Um, so the last question, of course, is coming back to this, this point from Rodrigo, which is the connection they made between analyticity of the potential and unitarity. So the bigger question now is if we can understand Heft versus SMEF from the perspective of geometry, uh, what's the relationship between the EFT geometry and unitarity violation? And there's a sort of creation of the papers by Anish and company uh, that you can write scattering amplitudes involving Goldstones and Higgses in terms of geometric quantities uh, uh, in your EFT geometry multiplying powers of momentum. So for example, if you just computed two to two scattering of two Goldstones into two Higgses, 
uh, the leading piece in Mandelstam S goes like the Riemann tensor with the legs evaluated on two Goldstones and two Higgses. Um, and then there's subleading in S, which goes like uh, covariant derivatives of the scalar potential with respect to two Higgses and two Goldstones. Okay. Um, so that's to say you can write your amplitude uh, in terms of Mandelstam invariance and uh, geometric objects, which are sectional curvatures. Okay. So this, again, this may be totally well known in the formal community. I'd say from the particle theory community, this is a somewhat novel observation. Uh, and so, you know, from, from this, it's clear that scattering amplitudes at least measure locally the curvature. But there's a big, there's two questions that stem from this. The first is, what's the systematic picture? So in Manahara and company, they just wrote down these amplitudes and made the observation. Uh, so what's the systematic picture? And the other question is, how does this relate to perturbative unitarity? Because what we've seen, if what we've seen is, you know, that the, which EFT you have to use is determined by the property of the manifold at the O4 invariant fixed point, that's very far from where we are, right? We're off at little h is equal to zero. Uh, and the, the O4 invariant fixed point is little h is equal to minus v. And if all we're measuring with scattering amplitudes is local curvature, under what circumstances do scattering amplitudes reconstruct uh, the properties of the theory at the invariant fixed point? And so, uh, well, so let's, let's see what the answer is. Um, so the first question, you know, what is the systematic picture? Again, I think for, for gravity folks, this is maybe more obvious, uh, but it's, it's somewhat fun nonetheless, um, which is uh, instead of working in terms of your original field parameterization, uh, it's convenient to work in terms of fields that are geodesic coordinates. Uh, so they're defined via the exponential map. So if your original coordinates were some phi, then you can define uh, some geodesic coordinates as your fields uh, eta through the exponential map. And then if you had some Lagrangian that you wrote in terms of, of you know, uh, a Taylor expansion of the metric and the Taylor expansion of the potential, then in terms of the geodesic coordinates, it actually immediately manifests the, uh, the geometry of the EFT in a couple of ways. So one is that just the coefficients of different terms in your Lagrangian in terms of the geodesic coordinate fields uh, naturally are factors of, say, the Riemann tensor uh, and covariant derivatives thereof, the covariant derivatives of the scalar potential. That's one interesting, so that's immediately where you see where, how these geometric quantities emerge in amplitudes. The other thing that's very nice is these are also just much simpler coordinates in which to compute scattering amplitudes um, because you're in an inertial frame. And so that means there are no two derivative cubic interactions in your Lagrangian. Uh, so in particular, you know, if you look at the two derivative terms, right, it's either the pure two derivative term or term that's uh, two derivatives in four fields. So there's no cubic terms of two derivatives. And that manifestly simplifies the scattering amplitudes uh, in particular at large Mandelstam S. So if you, uh, if you work in terms of these geodesic coordinates, uh, you, can, you can see lots of nice properties of your scattering amplitude. So for example, if you just look at uh, um, you know, four particle scattering amplitudes, two to two amplitudes, for the Mandelstam S independent part of that, uh, just goes like covariant derivatives of the potential as we saw by observation. Um, and if you also want to compute higher amplitudes with more legs, then it breaks up nicely into uh, a contact term, of course, which is just covariant derivatives of the potential, and then subleading terms which come from exchanging fields. But uh, those subleading terms don't pick up as many powers of Mandelstam S because there's no two derivative three field interactions uh, in the theory. So this is just a nice way. It's, it turns out to be a convenient basis for computing lots of amplitudes. Uh, and it's also the natural one to make a connection between the geometry of the EFT and perturbative unitarity violation. So uh, we can now actually come back and, and see in a much more general way this argument that Rotazzi and Polkowski made about analyticity uh, being connected to perturbative unitarity, um, which is to, to take a theory that is described by the heft EFT, work in terms of the inertial coordinates, and then we can make the following fairly crude argument. So the argument is, uh, if we know we had to live in heft, that means we know, for example, let's say we're living in heft because the potential was non-analytic at the O4 invariant point. Then that means, of course, that a Taylor expansion of the potential about that point doesn't converge. And also it means that derivatives with respect to goldstones of the Taylor expansion also don't converge at that point. Uh, and so, of course, that lack of convergence tells you that the ratio test fails. So there is some number, there's some term in that there's Taylor expansions where the next higher term in the Taylor expansion uh, exceeds that term uh, when leveraged by some factors of n in the bet. So there's some point where this convergence obviously where the Taylor series uh, flips, flips over. So how can we use that? Um, so you can just go ahead and reproduce or try to repeat the Falkowski-Rotazzi argument. Uh, 
uh, by saying, you know, if you look at inclusive scattering, inelastic scattering of two goldstones in any number of Higgses, uh, then of course that has the form of some prefactor uh, in the phase space and the square of the amplitude then we can just go ahead and approximate that, uh, the leading dependence in S by the contact terms to replace the total amplitude uh, by the contact piece. Uh, and then we can go ahead and use the fact that a Taylor expansion uh, of that, uh, this set of derivatives of the potential around the O4 invariant fixed point fails to converge. Uh, and so we can, we can bound that uh, by something where we actually pull out uh, the dependence on the potential itself. Uh, and then, of course, we just end up with something that, at least starting at some finite n, going to infinity or infinite number of Higgses, uh, just has the form of, uh, of a Taylor series of exponential. And so repackaging all that together, we get back the argument from Falkowski and Tazzi, uh that there's unitarity violation that happens exponentially quickly as Mandelstam S goes past 4 pi v. Um, and we could do so in a way that made manifest use of, of the fact that you know, something terrible was happening at the O4 invariant point. So, you know, what, what's really happening here, I, I mean, the picture that I, the way I would like to think about this is, although scattering amplitudes are only probing the local geometry of the EFT, these inelastic processes that are sums over scattering amplitudes into any multiplicity of final states, uh, once you sum over all of them, right, they are in some sense probing more globally uh, the structure of the geometry of the EFT. And, and in this case, it's unitarity violation, uh, picking up unitarity violation associated with singularity at the O4 invariant fixed point. Question. Yeah, so there, if I think of this as, as given by, instead of thinking about a cross section, just about forward scattering or like two goals on two, two, two goals on, right? Yeah. It, it, then so, what, what is the physics that, what is the intuition there? Uh, so, two, so, so, crucially, so with depending, good, which channel you should expect to see perturbative unitarity violation in does somewhat depend on the nature of the singularity. So, for example, if I looked at two goals on two goals on scattering, um, if I had a perfectly well-behaved, um, if, if my metric was well-behaved, right, so if that was non-singular, uh, then in general, the two goldstone to two goldstone scattering, um, well, if it's exactly standard model-like, then of course there is, it is perfectly unitary. Um, if it is smooth, but there's some curvature, then I will see unitarity violation, but the unitarity violation will not be exponentially fast at 4 pi v, right? It will be uh, loosely speaking, given by whatever the scale of the local curvature is. Okay, so your ability to see that the unitarity breakdown happens at 4 pi v, um, that was really coming from, from actually summing over uh, this whole set of processes rather than just looking at a specific channel. So any specific, to put it differently, any specific channel is still measuring a local curvature and will have unitarity violation, but that unitarity violation will be at a scale that depends on the particular coefficient. Um, but I guess that, that is if you think about it in terms of the tree amplitudes only, right? If, if I just think of this oh, as actual, the, like, the unitarity cut for the yeah. full amplitude. Good, sorry, so, so good. I mean, so obviously the, these inelastic processes should be related by the, the optical theorem to, to all loop order loop corrections to two to zero. So presumably, indeed, the, the fully, the, yeah, yes. Uh, so you, you would expect something similar to happen in a, in a wealth, in a well-posed, all-order radiative corrections to two, two scattering. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah it's, sorry, I also have yeah. a question. So, related to this, could it be possible that um, the quantum effect could come in and uh, cure this um, unitarity violation? Uh, well, so I mean, at the end of the day, right? It, this this is. The theory is unitary, right? It, the, the, the theory fully, cons carefully constructed is unitary. Uh, so, you, so, so, I mean, something always comes in to cure the unitarity violation. And if it's perturbative unitarity violation, then the sort of rule is extra loops on top of this are not what's coming in to cure it. It's the appearance of new states. Um, in principle, it is, it is I mean, it, I can't preclude the fact that, that some elaborate interplay between uh, effects at different orders in the loop expansion in a perturbative theory could restore unitarity. But um, I mean, generically, of course, that's not what happens. It's the appearance of additional light states. Um, so the, the real value, I mean, of this, apart from just, it's not just allowing us to reproduce the fakowski ritazzi argument, but this now allows you, wherever the singularity is, whether it's in the potential or whether it's in the two derivative terms inflected by the metric, analogous arguments. So here I made the argument for the potential. You could also make it for Ricci 
and its Taylor expansion. So you should be able to see all of the singularities of the O4 invariant fixed point in the form of a perturbative unitary violation uh, in this language. Um, so that, that hopefully provides a uniform criteria, but also sort of uniform uh, interesting physical tests. So, um, so my claim is that's a universal criteria for figuring out which EFT you have to use. Uh, it makes clear some practical considerations, even when you can use both EFTs to describe the data. And it provides a nice language to understand the sort of geometric definition of these EFTs, how you would actually see it in the data in terms of the violation of the term of the Okay, so that, that brings me to the end of the first part, which is, is how to understand different Higgs EFTs and come up with some sort of robust distinction between them. Um, the last part, which I appreciate, I only have a few minutes, but uh, I at least want to highlight something because it's, I think, of relevance to things that I've been thinking about and, and things that some of you have been thinking about at UCLA, uh, has to do more narrowly with the radius structure of the standard model EFT. So let's assume now we're in a situation where the Higgs EFT, you know, the standard model EFT is sufficient to describe the data as we see it. Uh, so there's no states that get most of their mass, say, from electric symmetry breaking. Um, now we'd just like to understand, you know, the properties of this theory. It is, after all, one of these EFTs is the, the theory of the universe. Uh, and so our job as field theorists is just to, to understand what it has to offer. Um, so, well, here, for example, is, uh, is the leading, uh, is a parameterization of the leading order uh, operators in SMEF at dimension six. Uh, again, I think the only reason, well, one reason I like to highlight this is that you know, we hadn't written down a complete basis of such operators in the standard model EFT until, until about a decade ago. Uh, and so the 59 operators uh, that include these bosonic operators uh, and plus four fermion operators, this is uh, a complete set of operators at, uh, at dimension six. And then of course, there's vastly increasing uh, multiplicity of operators as we go to higher and higher dimension. And so uh, now it's just an interesting question to ask what is the relationship between these operators and the actual observables that, uh, that we're going to go ahead and measure, measure in data. And a useful way, is, as you well know, I feel like this is probably preaching to the choir, but a very useful way to understand the relation between uh, the operators in the standard model EFT and the effect on observables is to just organize these operator classes in the space of multiplicities of fields and uh, multiplicities that these operators excite. Um, because that, you know, the, where these operators live in that space uh, sheds a lot of light on how they renormalize each other, so their radius structure, and also how they can interfere uh, with standard model amplitudes, which of course also populate uh, points in the space of helicities and multiplicities. So, you know, over the course of the last five years, and we were talking at T before my talk about how phenomenologists are more and more getting excited about these EFTs from the amplitudes perspective, over the course of the last five years, uh, I think there have been a lot of interesting insights into how the location of operators in the space of felicity and multiplicity has a huge impact on uh, LHC observables and also has a huge impact on the radius structure of the theory. So um, one of the lessons that you get immediately from thinking about uh, these operators in the space of felicities uh, has to do with you know, where you should actually be looking in the data for evidence of higher dimensional operators. So normally speaking, if, if you have the standard model EFT, uh, the first place you would hope to see evidence for its effects, of course, are in interference terms, just because if the irrelevant operators are suppressed by some high scale, uh, you want to pay as few powers of that high scale as possible. And so very generically, if you're looking for new physics effects, say in some 2 to 2 process, uh, the place you would first start to see evidence for, uh, for the contributions from the EFT operators is in their interference with the standard model because pieces that are the square of operators or higher powers in power counting are gonna be self-eating. But uh, crucially, of course, for these contributions to, uh, to interfere with the standard model, these interference terms to exist, the amplitudes in the standard model and new physics have to be non-zero in the same helicity channels. And uh, one of the great magics that Svi and others have taught us about uh, is the standard model is subject to helicity selection rules in which a variety of amplitudes uh, of various felicity configurations vanish. So I think this is a, a concise summary of the vanishing uh, four particle felicity amplitudes in the standard model. And uh, that of course then tells you that uh, there are many cases if the uh, EFT operators uh, populate helicity channels in which the standard model amplitudes vanish because of the selection rules, then the interference terms will be suppressed. And so there's a nice paper by uh, Azatov, Contino, Machado, Riva, in 2016 that sort of summarized this in two to two uh, by just pointing out the holistic configurations in which standard model amplitudes contribute 
and two to two scattering relative to the possible uh, configurations in which EFT operators contributed at dimension six. And so for many operators uh, with transverse, primarily with transverse cage bosons or some combination of transverse and longitudinal bosons, uh, there is non-interference resulting from the holistic selection field. And uh, this actually has a, a significant impact if you were measuring multi-boson processes at the LHC, has a significant impact on where exactly you expect the beyond the standard model physics to enter. Um, and so, you know, these three cartoons from the paper are just talking about if you're looking at processes that are sensitive to say four longitudinal vectors as opposed to two longitudinal vectors, two transverse or four transverse. Uh, if you think about it in, as a, in the space of energies of your scattering process and the couplings associated with new physics, uh, the conventional thing you would expect um, is that uh, for relatively low energies and small couplings, of course, the leading order effect is from the standard model and the next leading order is from interference. Obviously, as energies get large or couplings grow large, then it can be the square of the new physics contribution that dominates. But once you take into account these non-interference effects, the picture changes significantly. And so now you can end up, depending on what channels you're looking in, in situations where the leading new physics corrections come from dimension eight or from the combination of dimension eight and the square of the dimension six pieces. So this is a nice example of the holistic structure uh, of standard model and EFT amplitudes telling us something about the most promising place to look in data. Uh, the other place, of course, uh, where we learn a lot about the most promising place to look in data uh, has to do with, uh, with the normalization of various operators, how various operators feed into each other. So uh, here I really am uh, just advertising for, for your guys' work. Uh, but there's what I think is a beautiful paper from 2015 um, allowing us to understand uh, surprising zeros in the one-loop matrix of anomalous dimensions in the standard model EFT as being uh, precisely stemming from the solicity selection fields. So here, of course, the argument being that the logarithmic divergences in one-loop amplitudes involving an insertion of an EFT operator uh, are proportional to the product of the tree amplitudes coming from the two-particle cut. And so many of the surprising zeros in the matrix anomalous dimension uh, come from, from standard model solicity selection fields. So these are two things I think we've learned in the last five years uh, about the structure uh, of both tree and loop amplitudes in the standard model EFT coming from holistic. And um, so the only thing I want to add in the time that remains is uh, it's useful to, to think actually about the interface between the non-interference theorems as tree level statements and uh, these statements about the one loop processes uh, involving normalization, normalization of, of EFT operators uh, by each other. So um, you can ask what happens to the non-interference theorems at one loop. Uh, so you certainly expect that the non-interference theorems should be violated because in the standard model, all of the holistic selection rules are themselves violated, right? So we know that all of the holistic configurations in, uh, in four particle amplitudes that vanish at tree level in the standard model are non-zero at one loop. And so certainly those can interfere with the BSM amplitudes at tree level. Okay. All right, so that's a one loop, these theorems are violated. But it's maybe even more interesting to ask uh, if the violation can come from the other direction, which is to say there are, if you look at loop corrections to the BSM amplitudes, the EFT operators, interfering with the standard model amplitudes at tree level. And this is more interesting for the following reason, okay? Um, so although it, it wasn't, this wasn't observed in the original uh, non-interference paper, if you look at the classes of operators in the standard model EFT that contribute to these, uh, these final states, the ones that the holistic selection rules give you non-interference, uh, non-interference theorem. These operators, the EFT operators that populate these channels, if you have an EFT where the UV completion is perturbative, so there's a tree and loop classification, uh, then all of the operators that are relevant here are loop operators. Okay, so in a perturbative UV completion, they should all come with, with loop factors uh, appearing in the Wilson coefficients. And that's interesting for the following reason. That tells you that the non-interference Interference theorems are, are uh, forbidding interference that would formally be of the order a loop factor, a standard model coupling, some tree level piece of Wilson coefficient, and then uh, the, the, the scale of the dimension six operator. But um, it, it's also possible to have another contribution at that order that is not controlled by the non interference theorem. That contribution could come from taking a tree level operator dressing it with a loop, okay, that would give you a holistic configuration that the tree operator doesn't contribute to, but dressed with standard model interactions would contribute to one loop, and interfering that with a standard model tree amplitude. So that's not controlled by the non-interference theorems. That would also be formally at the same order, 
Uh, and then that would, in some sense, tell you, you know, in a perturbative UV completion, where you could talk about Wilson coefficients as being true in your loop, the non-interference theorems are just pointless. Because, yes, they tell you there are some interference terms that vanish at a certain order, but there are other terms at the same order that are non-zero. Okay, so it's worth asking, uh, what, what is the direction of the violation of the non-interference theorems where you dress the BSM, the EFT operators, with a loop? So we were just curious. We thought this was a loophole in the, the non-interference theorem, so we went ahead and computed uh, these operators. Uh, so, so what did we do? We, we in a non-abelian theory, just created representative classes of EFT operators, and then we computed uh, the loop corrections to the various uh, helicity amplitudes of interest. Um, now, you expect in these cases where you have a tree, a tree operator in the EFT that you then dress to make a loop amplitude, that give one of these interesting holistic configurations, those amplitudes should be rational, right? Because there, there was nothing, uh, you know, there's nothing there that exists to cancel a divergence. And so the amplitudes, if they're non-zero, should be purely, purely rational. And it turns out uh, that about half of them are rational and half of them are just zero. So the rational parts are entirely zero. And so this table is a sort of summary. Uh, so the table is showing you different classes of operators, uh, most of which are tree operators in a tree loop classification, and uh, their contribution to various helicity amplitudes organized by the multiplicity of the fields and the helicity configuration of interest. Um, and so, of course, in some cases, it's just not possible to make a diagram, so that's where I've drawn all the Xs. In some cases, sure enough, you get a non-vanishing rational part, uh, so that's the, the red Rs, but in many cases, you just get zero, so you get a totally vanishing rational term. And uh, it turns out you get zeros in every one of the cases where uh, uh, the dressing of a tree amplitude with standard model interactions would have given you a one loop violation of the holistic selection. So the holistic selection rule, the, sorry, the interference, non-interference theorem is much more robust than you would have expected uh, because all of the amplitudes that you would have thought could have violated it turn out to just vanish entirely. Um, there are various ways we didn't, you know, uh, Upon getting these results, I think then it was a sort of a matter of trying to figure out how to understand these zeros. Uh, we came up with a way of thinking about it that really had to do with the structure, the factorization structure of, uh, of rational parts of amplitudes. There was a much um, clearer, well, uh, possibly much clearer explanation, which I should have cited it here, but it was by uh, Jing Xu's group in Beijing, um, where they have started to think about holistic amplitudes. Well, they started to think about on-shell amplitudes uh, um, uh, a partial wave expansion of on-shell amplitudes and to come up with a basis of a sort of a set of basis amplitudes for the partial wave expansion. And their way of thinking about these zeros is that um, if you want to either study the renormalization of one operator by another or the contribution of an amplitude in the loop to a rational amplitude, um, then if the operator that is dressing and the, the, either the loop diagram or the operator that is being renormalized, if those share a pair of legs, then there is an argument about the angular momentum uh, having to be the same in the respective basis amplitudes. And that condition alone allows you to understand the presence of these zeros. Okay. So it just turns out there are many cases where these rational amplitudes vanish. It certainly was surprising to me. Um, the observation is not, I mean, the observation is, is what it is. Uh, it certainly tells you the non-interference theorems are more robust than you would have expected. But to me, the really interesting part relates to what you guys have been doing, which is that if there are vanishing rational amplitudes, uh, where the vanishing of the rational amplitude is there despite the existence of a diagram, then there should be many zeros in the two-loop matrix of normalist dimensions, right? There should be many cases where uh, there are two-loop diagrams and their cuts would give you a product of a tree-level piece and a loop uh, amplitude, and those loop amplitudes now vanish. And so uh, I would expect that this 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 connects this tells you more about the sparsity of the two loop matrix of anomalous dimensions. Now, of course, you know the the sparsity of the two loop matrix of anomalous dimensions. You guys have already been pointing out. I think the sparsity that results from these zeros is not the same as the sparsity that you pointed out in your earlier paper. Um, just because just inspection of a few cases, it doesn't seem to be the same. So that suggests there are additional zeros beyond the ones you've already pointed out. Um, I have certainly not had the time or the face space to try to push this forward to figuring out the zeros in the two matrix normal dimensions, uh, but I suspect you guys will probably get there first. The, the so, zeros, oh, wait. Uh, the, the zeros 
uh, he, he said the group in Beijing had a, an explanation. Is that explanation complete in the sense that every zero is explained? Um, they, I think they claim that every zero that we have computed is explained. They also claim that uh, applying this argument to the one loop matrix in almost dimensions. So it's certainly, it's certainly the case that, that, the, that uh, the understanding of the sparsity coming from the Felicity selection rules is not complete in the sense that there, it gives you most of the zeros, but not all of the zeros. And so the claim by the Beijing group is they can get all of the zeros. Uh, in the one loop matrix and almost dimension also using their selection. So um, yeah, so the claim, their claim is that it's, it is completely sufficient to understand all of the vanishing, vanishing rational amplitudes and to uniformly understand all of the zeros in the one loop matrix and almost dimensions. What, what was the so name? They, oh, sorry. Uh, it's Jing Shu. I'll send you probably the easiest thing is I can send you the reference offline. Okay. Uh, it's, it's Jing Shu, uh, Minyuan Zhang, and two other authors who, whose name is escaping me at the minute. Um, so related to those uh, explanation, do you know if um, that gives an insight about whether these um, zeros are only special at one loop, or they expect this to continue for two loop or higher? Yeah, so, so good to, to see, I mean, they didn't, I don't think they made a claim. So yeah, the way that the claim worked for the normalization of one loop was just, you know, you, you uh, well, so, so modulus and special cases, uh, obviously the renormalization, uh, of one operator by another is proportional in their partial wave expansion to a certain set of basis sample to the, to the basis amplitude of the renormal of the operator that appears, uh, and it is a require you know then they're requiring that the, the angular momentum excited by that basis operator has to be the same as the uh, angular momentum excited by the basis operator that's appearing in the loop, and so that's the sort of obvious thing to do at one loop. Uh, the generalization of that argument to two loops they didn't attempt to make. Um, so in principle, I think it is. It should be possible, or some version of it should be possible. But I, it doesn't. The argument doesn't appear in that case. Also, there's an extra piece, right? Which is the yeah. the three particle uh, phase space. Uh, exactly. So yeah. So so right. So so the, yeah. There, there it, it is exactly. So it's not totally obvious to me necessarily. Well, there should be some argument. I mean, there is going to be some argument that, and you guys probably have it. Uh, or we'll have it soon that, that allows us to understand the sparsity of two loops, but precisely because of these subtleties, um, you know, it's not totally as straightforward as doing the one loop matrix in all those dimensions. Um, but uh, but I'll, I'll gladly send you guys this, uh, this reference uh, that, uh, that at least claims, claims to under, I mean, certainly as a classification, it does succeed in explaining all those zeros that you found. Okay, uh, so that brings me to the end, uh, talk in two parts. Uh, I started out trying to understand uh, what the real distinction is between different Higgs EFTs, uh, although this probably seems like a trivial question. I don't think anyone who works on these EFTs has really known the answer robustly until this point. So I tried to develop some universal geometric criteria that distinguish the EFTs and really connect that to how we would test this experimentally, uh, which is, is by, you know, seeing you, by looking at the growth of amplitudes uh, and, and using that to distinguish between the two EFTs. Uh, and then, you know, so if we're fortunate enough to be in a universe where heft is the right theory, uh, then there's a lot we can do to understand heft. If we're fortunate enough to be in a universe where SMEFT is the right theory, then, you know, as you all know, it is a beautiful and remarkable theory. And I think the thing that is most interesting to me at this point is that uh, it seems to have more than just one loop miracle. And the structure of two loop miracles uh, is something uh, we contribute a bit by computing some of these rational amplitudes at one loop. Uh, but I think there's a very rich story uh, about the two-loop structure of these theories that hopefully we'll get to explore in the next few years. So, you know, the big picture, I and mean, why do I care about this at all? It's because this is a Higgs EFTs live at the intersection of novelty as theories, but also relevance to data. Uh, you know, we're really in the early days of understanding the novelty bit. And uh, we've got, you know, the, the thing that's great about the LHC physics program is the things that it will continue to do well in this long period of integrating luminosity is improve our tests of these EFTs. That's, you know, we might not, you know, like the, the kinematics reach for new particles is, is slowing rapidly, but uh, our, our improvement in our ability to discover uh, coefficients in the Higgs EFTs is going to be basically a constant function of time at the LHC. So hopefully we'll learn something more about the relevance too. So thanks very much. Thanks for uh, bearing with me and thanks very much for the chance. Okay, should uh, unmute and clap. Who can unmute? Maybe.
Maybe I could do it. Uh, that, that's that's in like one go. We unmute everybody. Can we do that? Can we do that. How you find out who's been watching Ed's lecture in the background? Uh, <laughs> that happened to us in the faculty meeting yesterday. Yeah, where someone unmuted someone else, and uh, we we heard Ed's talk. Uh, <laughs> I see. Uh, I'm not sure how to do that. Oh, that's okay. But other other questions? Uh, um, yeah, I, I have still have a question. Sure. Um, so I'm still a little bit confused about what's the physical meaning of the perturbative bond unitarity violation in the um, HEFD versus MAFT. Yeah. Because um, the perturbative bond unitarity violation is the exponential growth is coming from a large number of uh, Higgs uh, produced in the final state. But typically, I would expect the um, perturbation theory breaks down uh, when you have a large number of particles in the final state. So I guess the no, so, so this this is still a regime. Yeah, sorry. This this calculation is still in a regime where perturbation theory is valid. So it's not. It is. I mean, I, I obviously there are regimes in which high multiplicity uh, and the okay. combinatorics leads to breakdown of perturbation theory. But this is this is taking a slice of the channel where. Um, the, it is not the breakdown uh, of perturbation theory due to multiplicity that is giving you the violation of perturbation unitarity. There's also, so this is not explosion, right? This is not, this is a case where the, the, there is much phase space of it. For any term we're computing, there's large phase space available for any individual particle appearing in, in processes up to some high number. And so, you know, we are able to reliably compute that as opposed to situations where the phase space per particle is going to zero and, and perturbation theory is breaking down. There's also a practical question you could say, which is that at the LHC, especially because nothing is, these Higgses have mass, you're only ever going to probe processes with a hand, small handful of Higgses, right? And so there's just the in-principle question of, are you ever going to see, you know, the turnover in these cross sections that would point to the existence of some new state? Um, but the answer is this sort of n max, the point at which uh, you, as, as you, the multiplicity about which you start to see interesting effects is typically an order of few. So you would hope to see uh, in these cases where even if the perturbative unitarity violation wasn't happening in two to two, it might be happening in two to three or two to four, which is you know within the sort of kinematic reach of the LHC. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you.